Welcome to Educator's AP Biology course. I'm Dr. Carlene Eaton, and we'll be starting out the course with the discussion of elements, compounds, and chemical bonds. Although this is a biology course, we're starting out with some chemistry basics because life involves many chemical reactions. Chemical reactions occur constantly within the cells and are essential to life. For example, the conversion of carbon dioxide and water to glucose using sunlight as an energy source by plants is a chemical reaction, and this is known as photosynthesis. Animals use chemical reactions to break down food sources such as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins to release their energy to fuel cellular processes. Starting from the beginning with the discussion of elements. Elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances through chemical reactions. Matter is anything that takes up space. Elements are a form of matter. There are 118 elements on the periodic table. Here is shown one square, an example of an element from the periodic table, and this is oxygen. So there are 118 elements. Of these, 92 are naturally occurring. The remaining elements can be made in a, or created in a particle accelerator. However, only 92 are naturally occurring. Although there are 92 naturally occurring elements, in biology, we're gonna be focusing on mainly four elements. Living organisms are composed mainly of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. There are small amounts of other elements found in living organisms. For example, calcium, which is found in our bones. Phosphorus and magnesium are also found in small amounts. There are other elements called trace elements, and these are also essential to life, but they're found in very small or what's called trace amounts. An example of this would be iron. Iron is found in red blood cells, and it's essential in allowing us to carry oxygen using our red blood cells. Iodine is another example. The thyroid gland needs iodine to function correctly, and without enough iodine, people develop a condition called goiter. Here, looking at this example of oxygen on the periodic table, you'll notice a couple of numbers. The first is the atomic number, and we will get into exactly what this means, but for right now, I just want to give you an idea of how to read the periodic table of elements. O is the symbol for oxygen. Here's the full name, and then down here, is the atomic mass. A molecule is composed of two or more atoms bonded together in a specific arrangement. Compounds are composed of different elements that are combined in a fixed ratio. Let's look at an example of a molecule. O2 is two oxygen atoms bonded together. These are a molecule. However, since these are the same type of atom, this is not a compound. An example of a compound would be H2O or water. This is two atoms of water bonded to one atom of oxygen. And this is a molecule of water. And it is also a compound. What you'll notice here is that compounds are composed of different elements and they're combined in a fixed ratio. This is very important because if I look at water, H2O, and then I look at H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, I will notice that these are both composed of hydrogen and oxygen. However, they have very different properties. Water is the solvent of life, you drink it, your body is made largely of water, whereas hydrogen peroxide has entirely different properties altogether. And it is good for treating wounds, for example, but very different substance than water. So it's not just the atoms that are in a compound that matter, it's the ratio and the order that they're combined in. Elements are composed of atoms. 
And these are the smallest unit that an element can be broken down to that still retains the characteristic structure and property of the element. Now remember, um, elements are the substances that cannot be broken down into smaller particles through chemical reactions, but it is possible to break down an element further, just not through chemical means. And if you did break down an element further, um, what you, you could find are the, the different subatomic particles that comprise an atom. So let's look at what an atom is composed of. It's composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The central part of the atom is called the nucleus. And the nucleus contains protons and neutrons packed together tightly. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons, as the name suggests, are neutral. And orbiting around the nucleus, you will find the electrons, and these are negatively charged. These electrons are held in their orbitals by their attraction to the positively charged nucleus. The protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and this attraction keeps the electrons orbiting around the nucleus. Each element has a characteristic number of protons, and the atomic number I mentioned at the top of the periodic table is the number of protons. So the atomic number equals the number of protons. When we talk about an atom, we are usually talking about it in its neutral form, and that neutral form would have the same number of protons and electrons. So that the, if there's you know, four protons that are positively charged and four electrons that are negatively charged, they'll cancel each other out. So an example would be carbon. Let's look at carbon. Carbon has an atomic number of six. A second number associated with an element is its mass number. Okay, so atomic number is the number of protons. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So the mass number of carbon is 12. Now, if carbon is neutral, that means that I can determine that I have six protons from the atomic number, and since it's neutral, I also have six electrons. And then all I have to do to figure out the number of neutrons is to take this mass number, subtract the atomic number, and that will give me the number of neutrons. Here, the mass number is 12 minus six, therefore there are six neutrons. Sometimes you will see an element written as such. You'll see the symbol, like C for carbon, and then a number at the top and a number at the bottom. This is the mass number. This is the atomic number. The unit of mass that we use to express atomic or molecular weights is called the unified atomic mass unit, or just atomic mass unit. And this is abbreviated with a U. It's also the same as a Dalton, one Dalton. So a Dalton is abbreviated DA. Now, a proton or a neutron has a mass of 1.7 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. So that equals the mass of one proton or one neutron. If you add up the mass of the protons and neutrons, you have what's very close to the mass of the atom. And the reason for this is that electrons are much, much, much smaller than protons or neutrons, and their mass is therefore negligible. Frequently, we therefore talk about the atomic mass 
as being approximately equal to the mass number. So again, remember that the mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. Since the mass of electrons is negligible, the atomic mass, or the mass of the atom, is approximately equal to the mass number. When you look on the periodic table of elements, you'll see a slightly different number, which is at the bottom, and that's more of an exact atomic mass. It's a weighted average of masses of the various isotopes of the atoms. And if you just, of the element, if you just round that off, you'll get the mass number. OK, concept of isotopes. Let's look at carbon as an example and look at the various isotopes of carbon. Isotopes are forms of an element that have different numbers of neutrons. Remember that for an element to be the same element, it has to have this characteristic number of protons. For carbon, there are six protons. When we talk about this form of carbon right here that I've been discussing, carbon-12, it has six protons and six neutrons. However, you can talk about isotopes of carbon. One is carbon-13. So I have a 13 up here for my mass number, and that means if I took that 13, subtracted the number of protons, I'd end up with seven neutrons. So carbon-13 is a form of carbon that is much more rare than carbon-12, and it actually has seven neutrons. There's another isotope called carbon-14, and this is a radioisotope. It's a radioisotope. So if I took the mass number here, I said 14, and I subtracted the atomic number 6, I would come up with 8 neutrons. And carbon-14 is actually a radioactive form of carbon, so this is a radioisotope. The difference between radioisotopes and other types of isotopes is that radioisotopes are unstable. They actually decay spontaneously and they give off energy in the process. The nucleus decays and the number of protons or neutrons can change. The result is that it can actually decay and turn into a different element as it's decaying. These are very important in medicine. Um, for example, iodine-131 or I-131 is a radioisotope. I mentioned that iodine is important to the thyroid. Well, if somebody has thyroid disease or thyroid cancer, we can actually infuse a radioisotope into their body. It'll localize to their thyroid, and it'll help um, decrease the activity of that tissue or destroy malignant thyroid tissue. So radioisotopes do have important uses in biology and medicine. To understand chemical bonding and chemical reactions, you need to understand more about electrons, and particularly about the energy levels of electrons. Electrons are found at different energy levels, and the levels that they spend their time in are called electron shells. The outermost shell is extremely important in chemical bonds, and it's called the valence shell. Let's talk about the concept of energy a little more and potential energy. Recall that the nucleus is positively charged, whereas electrons are negatively charged. So electrons are attracted to that positively charged nucleus. The farther the electrons are from the nucleus, the greater what we call potential energy they have is. So potential energy, you can think of it as stored energy, or it's, it's energy that's there and that could be released, has the potential to be released. Think about if you were using a bow and arrow, and you pulled back the bow. You're using energy from your muscles, you're transferring it into the bow, and you're pulling it back. Now, that bow has potential energy, it has stored energy. When you let go of the bow, the arrow shoots out, the energy is transferred to shoot that arrow. Now, the greater the distance you pull back the bow, the harder you pull on it, the greater the potential energy stored in the bow. And it's the same idea with electrons. The farther the way away they are in the nucleus, from the nucleus, the farther the electron shell is that they are in, the greater the potential energy. To move to a shell that is more distant from the nucleus, an electron would have to use energy. To get closer, it would release energy. 
electrons pretty much stay within these shells and they only pass through them on their way to a different shell. Electrons fill up these lower energy shells first and then they go to the higher ones. The first shell can hold two electrons, whereas the second shell can hold eight electrons. And each shell has a characteristic number of electrons that it can hold. Again, the outermost shell is called the valence shell. And a lot of the chemical behavior of an atom is driven by a need to fill this valence shell. If the outermost shell is full, if the valence shell is full, then you have what's called an inert element. Inert elements do not readily interact with other atoms. They don't have a need to. Their valence shells are already full. So um, an example would be, okay, so inert elements have a full valence shell. For example, neon. Neon has 10 electrons. It has two in the first shell, and it has eight in the second. This is its valence shell. If there was more than 10, it'd have to go to the third shell. But since this shell is full, it's what we call an inert element, and it's not highly motivated to interact with other atoms. Within valence shells, the electrons are usually found in what's called orbitals. The shell gives the average distance from the nucleus where an electron is found, but that's just an average. Most of the time, electrons spend in particular regions called orbitals. Orbitals can have various different shapes, and orbitals are listed by a number and a letter. For example, this sphere is the 1s orbital. This tells me that it is in the first shell, and this tells me the shape. And so S, I just think of spherical. It's a globe or round shape. Each orbital holds two electrons. The first shell has only the 1s orbital. That holds two electrons. That's full. You need to go to the next shell. The next shell has a 2s orbital, so it's in the second shell, and it has a spherical shape. In addition, the second shell also has three p orbitals. p orbitals have this dumbbell shape. And I've only shown two here for simplicity, but in the second shell, there is one 2s orbital, and there are three 2p orbitals. Each of these holds two electrons. So two here and two in each of the three orbitals, this to holds a total of eight electrons. The behavior of an atom is often driven by a need, again, to fill the valence shell. Let's look at an example of fluorine. Fluorine has nine electrons. That means that this 1s orbital is going to be full. So here we see these all together. Remember, there's actually this third orbital here, this third p orbital. Draw that in. Just not shown in order for simplicity, but um, looking at these electron orbitals with fluorine. This first shell would have two electrons in it. That's full. Then fluorine needs to go up to the second shell. The 2s orbital here has two electrons in it. So I used up two in the first. That left me with seven. I've used up two more. I have five. One of the p orbitals can hold two. Another p orbital can hold two. And this last p orbital only has one. So there is a single electron missing to complete the valence shell. And bonding has to do with completing that valence shell. One thing you'll also notice about molecules is they can differ in shape. And the shape of a molecule has to do with the position of the orbitals. And the position and shape of the orbitals can change when bonding occurs. So let's go ahead and talk about bonding. 
Covalent bonds are formed when atoms share electron pairs. Remember that the atom wants to fill its valence shell. So let's look at hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron. So it's just got a single electron in the 1s orbital. That's its valence shell. The first shell is the valence shell in this case, and it holds one electron. It needs one electron to fill the valence shell. One way for the hydrogen to get to fill that shell would be to share an electron pair. And that's what covalent bonding is. In the simplest case, hydrogen could share an electron pair with another hydrogen. So this second hydrogen is also lacking a full valence shell. Therefore, if they each shared an electron pair, if they shared one electron pair, they would have full valence shells. Another way to write this that helps to clarify is called a Lewis dot structure. Both of the methods I've shown here are a covalent, show a covalent bond. This is a single bond. And it means that one electron pair is being shared by the two molecules, by the two uh, atoms, by the two atoms. So this forms a molecule of hydrogen, H2, via sharing of one electron pair in order to complete the valence shell. Atoms can share more than one pair of electron. An example would be oxygen. Looking at oxygen a little bit more closely, it has eight electrons. That means the first shell has two electrons. It's full. The second shell has six electrons. But to have a full valence shell, it needs two more, two more electrons. Therefore, sharing just one pair of electrons would not fill the valence shell. It needs to share two pairs. So oxygen, therefore, can do that a couple of different ways. Um, let's look at the example of CO2. That would be a carbon double bonded to one oxygen, and then on the other side, double bonded to a second oxygen. This means, or if you looked at the Lewis dot structure, that what's happening is a double bond is formed. Double bond is formed when two electron pairs are shared. So this is sharing two electron pairs because oxygen needs to share two electron pairs in order to complete its valence orbital. Now what's going on with carbon? Well, remember that carbon has six electrons. That means the first shell contains two electrons and the second shell has four electrons. So it needs four electrons to complete its valence shell. So looking at look what's going on with carbon, it's sharing one, two, three, four electron pairs. So the oxygen has a full valence shell, sharing two. This oxygen has a full shell, sharing two. And this carbon has a full shell, sharing four electron pairs. So covalent bonding, is, a covalent bond is formed when the atoms share electron pairs. There are different types of covalent bonds. There are polar and there are nonpolar covalent bonds. Some atoms share the electron pairs equally, whereas others do not. In certain situations, an electron pair is more strongly attracted to one atom of the bond than it is to the other. That would form a polar bond. When there is an equal attraction between the, uh, of the electron pair to the two atoms, that is called a nonpolar bond. For example, I talked about H2, hydrogen molecule formed by a single bond between two hydrogen atoms. Since these atoms are both the same, the electron pair is going to spend equal time near both of the atoms. This would be a nonpolar bond. Let's contrast that with water, H2O. Oxygen is what's called electronegative. 
it's very electronegative. And what electronegativity refers to is the attraction that a particular atom holds for electrons. Electrons are more attractive, are more attracted to a highly electronegative uh, atom. So the more electronegative an atom is, the more strongly electrons are attracted to it. The oxygen here is more electronegative than the hydrogens. Therefore, in oxygen, uh, in water, H2O, here's some electron pairs being shared. There's a pair shared here and a pair shared here. But these electrons tend to spend more time near the oxygen atom. They don't share equally their time between the two atoms. They spend more time close to the oxygen atom. What that does is results in what's called a partial negative charge for the oxygen, delta minus, this delta symbol, and then a minus next to it means partial negative charge. Since the electrons are hanging out with the oxygen more and electrons are negative, this is going to end up with a partial negative charge. Now, the opposite is going to happen with the hydrogen. It develops a partial positive charge. Because the electrons are by the oxygen more, slightly more negatively charged oxygen, slightly more positively or delta plus over here by the hydrogen. Because of the shape of water, it has this V shape, this side of the molecule ends up overall slightly negative and the hydrogen side ends up slightly positive. So this is what we call a polar molecule. H2, hydrogen molecule, is nonpolar. Now let's look at CO2. Again, we have these electronegative oxygens, and the electrons are more drawn to these oxygens than they are to the carbon, but because this is a linear molecule, these two balance each other out. Oxygen's pulling this way, oxygen's pulling it that way, but you don't end up with one side of the molecule that's overall electronegative versus, or overall partially negative versus partially positive charge because of this linear shape. So it's not just the atoms, it's also the configuration of the atoms that determines whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about water. Water is extremely important to living beings, and the fact that water is polar gives it many important properties. Another name for polar molecules like water is hydrophilic. Polar molecules are hydrophilic. This means they are water loving. They are attracted to um, water, they dissolve in water. You might have heard the expression, like dissolves like. So polar molecules dissolve in other polar substances. Nonpolar are hydrophilic or water-fearing. Excuse me, hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. Nonpolar molecules are hydrophobic. Polar molecules are hydrophilic. So nonpolar molecules do not dissolve well in water. Like dissolves like, nonpolar molecules like fats dissolve in other nonpolar molecules. That's why oil and water don't mix. If you're making a recipe and you need to put some oil into a mixture that contains water, you'll see that the oil separates out. It doesn't dissolve in water because the oil is hydrophobic and water is polar or hydrophilic. Hydrophobic fat or lipid or oil and a hydrophilic solution such as water will not mix. All right, a second type of bond is an ionic bond. Remember that in covalent bonding, the atoms share an electron pair. Another way to fill the valence shell is not by sharing an electron pair, but by losing or gaining an electron. An ionic bond refers to the attraction between positively charged ions, which are called cations, and negatively charged ions, which are known as anions. This is best understood through example. So let's look at NaCl or sodium chloride. Sodium has 11 electrons. That means the first shell will contain two electrons. The second shell will contain eight electrons. This gives 10. 
and the third shell will have a single electron. Obviously, the valence shell, the third shell, is not full. Chloride has 17 electrons. The first shell, again, two electrons. Second shell, eight electrons. Third shell, seven electrons. This shell holds eight electrons. So to fill its valence shell, chlorine needs one electron. This problem is solved when sodium transfers an electron to chlorine to form a chloride ion. Okay, sodium transfers an electron to, to chlorine. Let's think about what would happen. If sodium transfers an electron, it's going to be down to 10 electrons, but it still has 11 protons. That means it's going to end up positively charged because it has one more proton than an electron. So we say it as a plus one positive charge, or we just show it as a plus. Some, uh, an, an uh, ion could have a two plus or three plus positive charge. This has just a single, so it's a plus. It transferred one electron to chlorine. Chlorine, in turn, now has 18 electrons. So it has one more electron than proton, which is going to give it a negative charge. Chlorine with a negative charge. It received one electron. This is now called a sodium ion, and this is called a chloride ion. Sodium is positively charged, so it is a cation. Chloride is negatively charged, so it's an anion. This step is not actually the ionic bond. It's necessary in order to get to the ionic bond, but the ionic bond refers to the attraction uh, between this positively and negatively charged, these positively and negatively charged ions. Sodium doesn't just transfer the electron and then float away. In fact, these two stay associated with each other as NaCl, which is an ionic compound or a salt. Notice that this is not a molecule. Molecules are held together by covalent bonds. It is a compound, though. It's an ionic compound. These are also called salts, or this is table salt. Um, notice that the problem of the valence shells has been solved. Since sodium lost this electron, once it loses it, there's no electrons in the third shell. The second shell becomes the valence shell, and it's full. Chlorine has gained an electron. It now has eight electrons in its valence shell, so that shell is full. So these two have achieved completing their valence shells, but it's not by sharing an electron pair, it's by losing or gaining an electron. And then, due to the positive and negative charges, they stay associated with each other. Salts often form crystals, and this is because of the interactions via these ionic bonds. The strongest type of bond is a covalent bond, but these other types of bonds are very important as well. And they're often called weak bonds. One type of weak bond is a hydrogen bond. Now, while a single hydrogen bond might not do a lot, many of these together can achieve something and actually have strength. So even though bonds such as hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, they are very important. Let's look at water as an example of hydrogen bonding. A hydrogen bond is formed when a hydrogen atom that is covalently bound to an electronegative atom is attracted to another electronegative atom. Revisiting the idea of water, oxygen, hydrogen. Recall that this is a polar bond, that the oxygen atom is partially negatively charged while the hydrogen atoms have a partial positive charge because the electron pair favors the oxygen atom. So because this hydrogen is partially positively charged and the oxygen is partly negatively charged, there's an attraction between the hydrogen and oxygen. Not just that oxygen is bonded to, but oxygens on other water molecules. 
So these dotted lines indicate hydrogen bonds. Here's the covalent bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. And then this hydrogen is attracted to this nearby water, the oxygen atom. This hydrogen is attracted to this nearby oxygen atom. And so these, a lot of complex hydrogen bonding goes on with water. As you can see here, hydrogen bonds can hold different molecules together, and they can also hold parts of large molecules together. For example, proteins fold into complex shapes or conformations, and those shapes are often held in place by hydrogen bonding between one region of the protein molecule and another region. This hydrogen bonding is responsible for a lot of the important properties of water that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Now that we've discussed bonding, we're going to go on to talk about chemical reactions. And molecules undergo reactions by forming or breaking bonds. Let's look at a typical chemical reaction. CH4, which is actually methane, combines with two molecules of water, so 2O2. And those undergo a chemical reaction to form carbon dioxide, CO2, plus two molecules of water. The initial substances involved, so on this side, are the reactants. Those end up forming products. So the substances that you end up with are called the products. Notice with this reaction, what we have is a balanced equation. So this equation is balanced, meaning that the atoms that I have on the left, if I count those up, and I count up the atoms I have on the right, I have the same number and the same type. No atoms were lost or gained. So let's look at the left side and the right side. Let's look at carbon. I have one carbon on the left. On the right, I have one carbon. Hydrogen. On the left, I have four hydrogens. On the right, I have two H2s. So that's two times two. That gives me four hydrogens. I also have oxygen. On the left, I have two times two oxygens of four oxygens. Here I have O2. That's two oxygens. And then I have two times O, which is two more oxygens. Give me a total of four oxygens. So we say that this equation is balanced. No atoms were lost or gained. They're just combined differently. Reactions can proceed in both directions. So this reaction could go in reverse. You could combine CO2 and two molecules of water to get back two oxygen molecules plus a methane molecule. If the ratio is not changing, we say that the reaction is in equilibrium. If, if ratios of molecule, if ratio of the molecules is unchanging. Now, that is not to say that I'm going to have exactly equal amount of methane in CO2. It means the ratio is not changing. In fact, often a reaction favors one direction. So maybe this reaction favors formation of CO2 and water. In that case, I might have 10 molecules of CO2 for every molecule of methane. But if, these, if the ratio is not changing, I still maintain that ratio. We say that the reaction is in equilibrium. I'm not gaining more and more CO2 relative to methane than the reaction is in equilibrium. Now, when we deal with chemistry and chemicals, we're dealing with very, very small amounts. And it wouldn't really be practical to just use grams when we're talking about molecules and chemicals and atoms. So since the mass is so small, chemists have developed a different system with which to measure molecular masses and concentrations of chemicals in solutions. A mole is simply a number. It is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. If you say you have a mole of something, you're saying you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. This is no different than saying you have a dozen of something. If you say, oh, I have a dozen apples, you're saying I have 12 apples. The same way you could say I have a mole of apples, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd apples. You could say you have a mole of glucose, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd 
glucose molecules. This number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, is known as Avogadro's number, and it's named after an Italian physicist. So let's talk about molecular mass and moles. If you take a sample of an element that is equal to its atomic mass, you will have one mole of that element. Take a sample of an element equal to the element's atomic mass. you will have one mole of the element. For example, carbon. Carbon has an atomic mass equals 12. Therefore, if I take 12 grams of carbon, equals one mole of carbon. That means that in 12 grams of carbon, you will have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms. Now, let's say you're not just dealing with a molecule, or a, excuse me, an element. Let's say you're dealing with a molecule. So I know for an element that I just have to look at the atomic mass, take that amount in grams, and I have a mole. In order to find a mole of a molecule, I need to find the molecular mass of the molecule. Molecular mass equals the sum of the masses of the atoms in the molecule. Simple example, water, H2O. Here I have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Hydrogen has a mass of 1. Oxygen has a mass of 16. So I'm going to take one hydrogen atom with a mass of 1 plus a second hydrogen atom with a mass of 1 plus an oxygen atom with a mass of 16, and I'm going to get 18. This is the molecular mass. If I take a sample of 18 grams of water, this is going to equal one mole of water, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. Something else to understand is that Let's say I had a dozen water molecules. Let's talk about a dozen instead of a mole. I say, oh, I have a dozen water molecules. And then you ask me how many hydrogens I have. Well, if I broke up the water, the dozen water molecules, into just hydrogens and oxygens, each water molecule has two hydrogens, hydrogen atoms. So I actually would have 24 hydrogens and 12 oxygens in that water, in that mole, or in that dozen. And that doesn't. So if I said, I have a dozen water molecules, that means I have a dozen water molecules. But if I broke them up, I would actually have two dozen hydrogen atoms and one dozen oxygen atoms. In that same way, if you have a mole of water and you broke it up, you would end up with two moles of hydrogen atoms and one mole of oxygen atoms. This has to do with mass and when you're working with dry or just, just certain chemicals, it's very helpful, but a lot of times we're working with solutions. And when we work with solutions, we talk about molarity. One molar solution, a one molar solution, and we'll often write this as one mole, equals one mole of a substance dissolved 
in one liter of solvent. And this is written as, it could be written as 1M as shown. For example, let's say I wanted a one molar solution of glucose. Glucose has the chemical formula, the molecular formula, C6, H12, O6. I need to figure out the molecular mass. Okay, so I have glucose and I want a one molar solution. To do that, I need to take, I need to dissolve one mole of glucose in one liter of water. The molecular mass of glucose is going to be the mass of carbon, which is 12, times I have six carbon atoms, plus the mass of hydrogen, which is one, times 12 hydrogens, plus the mass of oxygen, which is 16, times six oxygen atoms. And if you add these up, you will get 180. Therefore, the molecular mass of glucose is 180. In order to get a one molar solution of glucose, dissolve 180 grams of glucose in one liter of water. Okay, so molarity. To make a one molar solution, figure out the molecular mass. That'll tell you how much of something you need, how many grams you need to get one mole. So I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd glucose molecules in 180 grams of glucose. And I'm going to dissolve that in one liter of water, and I will have a one molar solution. All right, let's try out some examples now. Example one, the atomic number of fluorine is nine, and its atomic mass is 19. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons does it have? Is it inert? Why or why not? Remember that the atomic number equals the number of protons. The atomic mass we often use interchangeably with mass number, although they're not exactly equal because the, the mass of the electrons is negligible. We often use them interchangeably. So the atomic mass equals 19. Um, so in this case, we're using that as the mass number as well. And therefore, if I take, if I know that that's equal to the number of neutrons plus the protons, then I simply take 19 minus 9, so the atomic number is 9, to give me 10 neutrons. All right, so let's keep track of what we have. We have the atomic number. Protons equal the atomic number, equal 9. Neutrons, I'm just taking the mass number, which is the number of neutrons and protons, and I'm subtracting the number of protons from that, and that leaves me with 10 neutrons. In its neutral form, the number of protons and electrons will be equal, so I'm going to have 9. 9 protons, 10 neutrons, 9 electrons. Is this inert? Well, remember that an inert element has a full valence shell. So let's look at the electron situation. I have 9 electrons. In the first shell, I have 2 electrons. The second shell is going to have 7 electrons. This is the valence shell. This shell holds 8 electrons. Therefore, this is short one electron. In, it, this does not have a full valence shell, so it is not inert because its valence shell is not full. Second example, we have a chemical equation here. Example two, six carbon dioxides plus six 
water molecules, gives sexually glucose plus oxygen. So this equation shows the formation of glucose. What coefficients need to be placed in front of the products in order to balance the equation? A balanced equation means you aren't going to lose anything in terms of atoms or gain any atoms between reactants and products. Reactants. For carbon, I have six carbon molecules. Products, six. Oxygen. Six times two is 12, plus one is 13. Here on the right, or excuse me, correction, this is six times two is 12, and then six times one oxygen in each of the six water molecules is six, so that's going to be actually oxygen is going to be six times two is 12, plus six more to give me 18. On the right, I only have 6 plus 2. I only have 8. So I've got a problem right here. This part is not balanced. Hydrogen. 6 times 2 is 12. On the right, I have 12. So I need to fix the oxygen. And you can actually use fractions. So you could use fractions on the left to fix it make this number of oxygen smaller, but it would actually be easier to just use a whole number on the right. Since the carbons are correct and the hydrogens are correct, I don't want to mess with this, with the glucose. I just want to focus on the oxygen where the problem is. So I'm going to try some different coefficients. I need quite a few more, so I'm going to start out with four. I'm going to try putting a four in front of this and see what happens. Now I have six oxygens plus four times two, which is eight. 8 plus 6 equals 14. That's not enough. So let's try a coefficient of 5. I have 6 oxygens here, plus 5 times 2 is 10. That's 16. Remember, I want 18. So that's not big enough. Let's try again. 6 times 2 is 12, plus the 6 I have here is 18. Therefore, a coefficient of 6 in front of this O2 will balance this equation because now I would have, still have my 6 carbons on both sides. I still have my 12 hydrogens, and now I have 18 oxygen on the left and 18 oxygen atoms on the right. So this is now a balanced equation. Example 3, KCl, potassium chloride, is a salt that disassociates into potassium and chloride ions. What type of bond holds K KCl together? Describe this type of bond and how it is formed. Well, this is a salt and it disassociates to form ions, therefore it's an ionic bond. This is formed by the attraction between the negatively charged chloride and the positively charged potassium ion. What had to happen for this to occur is that potassium transferred one electron to chlorine. The result is that there, were, there was one more proton than electron left on potassium and you ended up with potassium ion. Chlorine got an extra electron and became the positively, the negatively charged chloride ion. And these two are attracted to each other due to their opposite charges. So this is an ionic bond. Example four, sucrose or table sugar is given by the formula C12H22O11. What mass of sucrose in grams would need to be added to one liter of water to make a one molar solution of sucrose? Remember that a one molar solution is one mole of a substance dissolved in one liter. So to get one mole or one molar solution of sucrose, we need 
one mole of sucrose. Remember that in order to figure out how much of a substance you'd need to get a mole, you need to figure out the molecular mass. So I need to figure out the molecular mass of sucrose, of C12H22O11. The atomic mass of carbon is approximately equal to 12, discounting the electrons. So that's the carbon atomic mass. Hydrogen mass is 1, and the mass of oxygen is 16. Therefore, I'm going to have 12 carbons times a mass of 12, plus 22 hydrogens times a mass of 1, plus 11 oxygens times a mass of 16. And if you figure this out, 12 times 12, it comes out to 144 plus 22. 11 times 16 is actually 176, so that's 342 grams. Therefore, I would need to add 342 grams of sucrose to one liter of water to form a one molar solution. Thanks for visiting educator.com, and I will see you next time.